maybe difficulties that you may be seeing in your in your projects that we also have experience. So uh, I'll I'll do a little bit of an overview of risk and fire risk, the first part of the presentation, and this a little bit theoretical. I'll I'll keep it short. Uh, then the next two points, I will touch a little bit on what uh, Rob was saying, some of the ongoing research in uh, both in the nuclear industry and the SFP, and, and this will be short. I, I just going to point out uh, material that, that we may find helpful even outside the nuclear industry, right? Uh, information that we have developed that in my view uh, help us all in the fire protection community and has nothing to do with the specific uh, 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 application of nuclear power which was who funded this research uh, and then uh, after that i have uh, slides on on applications outside the nuclear industry of risk assessment uh, that we have been involved in the last uh, three years. And I, of course, some of those applications uh, are, are proprietary or uh, classified. And I, you will notice that I stay away from, from some details, but uh, I'll, I'll point out uh, some of the difficulties we may have had uh, using risk, uh, making it work, and how we have approached the problem. So that's the agenda. Uh, I can stop for questions at any time. And then at the end, we can also uh, 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 debate uh, uh, more questions. So uh, this is consistent with what we are developing for the SFP in the SFP Engineering Guide for Risk Assessment. Uh, in, in that document uh, that Rob was uh, mentioning, there is a fancy flowchart like in every risk uh, uh, book about how to uh, do the process. But uh, the, the, main, the main elements that we are promoting are this. There is a fire hazards analysis. And once you identify the hazards, you do your scenario development and then we are trying to simplify the process of assessing risk uh, either quantitatively or qualitatively. But the main message in the guide and, and in the applications we have worked on is that it all starts with the fire hazards analysis and then we incorporate risk into that, right? We develop the different scenarios that captures all those hazards and then we, we qualify those scenarios in terms of frequency uh, and consequence. Uh, of course, at this point, there are two uh, major challenges that we encounter in all of these applications. Uh, one is uh, a risk matrix, right? An acceptance criteria for whatever risk results we obtain. There are some industries that uh, have already risk matrices uh, developed. Uh, the nuclear industry is one where we kind of know the numbers that, that the regulator would accept. Uh, I have done applications for the Navy where I have seen a, a risk matrix with numbers that, that represent right what they would accept. Uh, in that case, I've seen more than one for different offices, which sometimes make it complicated. Uh, but there are others in which we don't have such uh, matrices. And uh, when we have to calculate risk and represent it, we need to then have as a conversation with the authority having jurisdiction on what, this, how, what this, these numbers mean and if they are acceptable. Uh, a way that we have used uh, to try to convey that message is to uh, compare our risk with risk that we would obtain if you're complying with the code, right? We, we had a, a, I'll discuss it later, but as a brief introduction, uh, issues with complying with the code. And uh, so we build a model like the one I have here uh, with a, a 
for a facility that would be code compliance versus the facility that had the issues that they were having and explore the difference in risk and develop a case for the authority having jurisdiction in terms of, uh, you know, there's really not much risk difference here. And the, the, the issues with the code compliance are not driving the risk uh, higher. Uh, so that, would, that was the strategy taken in an in a industry where we really didn't find any uh, acceptable uh, risk criteria. Now, uh, another, as a matter of introduction, uh, I usually like to cover the topic of how we think about risk and model it, right? And, uh, and, and as I was saying in the previous slide, risk is the frequency and the consequences. Uh, in this case, okay, uh, by the way, I, I, I may see that you guys are, are in, in the chat. Uh, I am not following up, so, so maybe if there is a question, let me know. If not, we'll look at them at the end. So uh, anyways, I was uh, saying that we, we think about frequency and consequences, but to make risk really powerful, we need to incorporate the fire protection features that we may have in our program. And uh, how we have done that is introducing this concept of these conditional probabilities that represent the mitigation strategies that we have in each scenario. So a scenario will have a frequency of, of a fire starting. It will have some consequences. In between, we have to fail all our mitigating strategies. And it is when we are able to model risk like this, where we have the likelihood of the fire starting its consequences and all the elements that we have in the fire protection program that that then risk begins to be a useful tool for for regulating managing right and designing and designing stuff so so i i like to point usually this out right that that we can map most of the elements in our fire protection program to the risk equation so that it really becomes a useful model uh, we have fire prevention and that affects our frequency, right? Better fire prevention reduces our frequency. Uh, we have our detection and suppression systems uh, and, and those have its procedures and its reliability, et cetera, and we maintain them. So, so that is reflected in our ability to mitigate the fire, right? Uh, same, same our ability to provide egress paths. And, and at the end, Right, if we need to express additional fire protection features that we may not have in all the industries, right? For example, in the nuclear industry, we need to provide safe shutdown. Well, that, that can be expressed in the consequence term. Anyways, the, the key is that in the different applications that, that I'll cover later, you would see that our attempt had been to map all these elements to a, a, a model where we know in these different parameters what to do to improve safety. And that's the key with, with risk uh, uh, model. All right, so with that, there are uh, a few event trees that we use uh, in, in fire risk to capture our scenarios. And I think they boil down to two, that almost every application we have done on fire risk, you can organize the risk assessment using two event trees. With, uh, and, uh, and, and you have to edit it a little bit to represent the specific problem and, and the, and, and the specific fire protection program that covers it. But understanding these two structures allows you to basically frame almost any, any risk problem uh, in, a, in a systematic way. And, and it, it's all based on right frequencies, mitigating strategies, and consequences. 
So uh, again, I have two of those. There are these two slides that I'll cover now uh, that I, I can tell you almost every, every problem can be framed in this way. And then when you start seeing the results, you see the interactions or, right, and the capabilities of your program with respect to these three parameters that we talk that are linked to the, the actual elements that you have in place uh, for in your fire protection program. So one is the one I call this uh, accident sequence. It's a scenario progression tree in which we have ignition and then we have a set of damage states. Okay, what damage is, what is damaged by the fire first, uh, second, third. So if I provide a mitigation strategy at any point in these states, I stop the progression and I am done. Suppression was successful. And if at that point in time I fail, then I go to the next state with I have more and more damage. And then I try suppression or fire control at the next step in time. And if I'm successful, I end. Okay. So at each end state, we have an increased set of damage, right? A higher consequence. And, and this structure, it's I find it very convenient because we can put at each of these points in time in a scenario progression our ability to suppress the fire, right? We can, you can see it here that this would be the frequency at the end, we have some consequences. And in between, the probabilities that go in between are our mitigation strategies, okay? They could be, they could be uh, probabilities of barrier failing, probabilities of sprinkler failing, uh, and all of that needs to be combined into a, a a number that we put in. So this is the first comprehensive tree uh, that we use all the time. And, and once you, you're familiar with the structure and, and, and have framed a problem this way, you find that, that you know, it's probably the most practical way of understanding how the scenario progresses and then modeling it. The next one, it's also pretty useful, and this is something that we put together years ago in trying to develop a tool for the nuclear industry to capture a full fire protection program. Because we have a lot in it, and then we have applied this in, in, other, in other industries. So, so the idea was to create a chronology at the top that would capture your capabilities, right? If you have a prompt activities, meaning, uh, let's say, for example, this is a, a, an application for a submarine and, and all the crew is well-trained to, or and go through training to quickly detect and control fires that are small. They know how to use fire extinguishers. They know how to, uh, uh, so, so you would have capabilities for prompt detection and suppression. Then you would have the automatic systems and you would have a delayed uh, response by let's say a fire department or fire brigade, depending on the application. And you can then build a tree that says, what if my automatic suppression fails? Then I'm here, I'm relying on this fire brigade and then, or a fire department and they operate or fail. So we, we found that this is a way that a lot of your detection or all of the detection and suppression capabilities that you have could be put in a model that produces a set of outcomes where you fail to suppress. So, so for example, let's say I don't have any prompt capability and this value is a zero, all my numbers are gonna go through this branch. It, and then I say, do I have automatic suppression? Yes or no. And then here comes your reliability, okay? And, and in some facilities they keep track 
of, of the inspections and, and you have reliability numbers. Of course, there are some other industries that we have to go through uh, references and find generic numbers that characterize detection. Same for suppression. So let's say your sprinkler, your, your detection fails and then you're relying on sprinklers. If the sprinkler fails and you don't have a fire uh, department or a fire brigade response, then you have no suppression. And essentially the, the branches that end up having no suppression, it's an indication, right, when we add them, that this is a, a probability of failing to suppress, which then we can incorporate in our, in our risk equation. So the point is when we talk about risk modeling, uh, we always try to, to make sure that this model captures their facility, their configuration, and your fire protection program. And these are two trees that, in my view, we, we have used in a lot of applications because it's a standard structure that, with a little bit of editing to make it project-specific, can quickly begin to offer uh, insights on what, how important uh, those mitigation systems are. And I'll, I'll cover a little bit of those applications uh, later on. Anyways, in, in, in much more complicated studies, in, in, and this begins to go into right, commercial nuclear power plant applications, then the models become much more complicated. We have a set of human actions, and, and this really, uh, sometimes it's, it's just, uh, quite frankly, uh, only being afforded by, by industries that are highly regulated uh, and can put money in fancy risk assessments that you maintain and build uh, to continuously operate. Th these are not, you know, applications that you do uh, to solve a problem. This is more to run uh, a facility. And, and as many of you know, so, so, I mean, there is a lot of resources uh, that are put here uh, over many years to, to support this. But in these cases, we have a system, okay? Uh, and the difference that I like to, to, to always mention is that uh, there are applications where we're only dealing with fire protection, right? Uh, what are my mitigation, I'll go back to these slides, that I need that are useful for an accident? Uh, I am not protecting a system, right? I may be protecting a building, uh, but in the example of the nuclear industry, I am protecting an operating plant, right? A system. Uh, and that requires a lot more modeling because we have to develop a model for the system and see how the fire affects that system. And that's the difference, right? In, in some of the applications that I'll debate later, we're talking about uh, fire protection issues, right? Lack of, lack of compliance in fire protection, but we don't have a system that we need to see what fire will do to it. Uh, electrically, for example, like happening in a, in a power plant. And uh, uh, because of that, we end up creating a much more com uh, complex uh, models. All right, so that was a, a brief overview on, on risk. Uh, I want to point out three reports that have been developed over the last 20 years that have very good information for us fire protection engineers that have nothing to do with the nuclear industry uh, and can be helpful in, in many applications. And are the ones that I, I highlight here in blue. The latest one, it's this num report, uh, NUREC 2233. And the reason I think this is very good is because last year uh, we completed a set of, of fire tests of ordinary combustibles, what we call in the nuclear industry transient fires, uh, 
that we had a group of, of utility engineers advising on what was realistic. And it included all kinds of, of industrial packages that you would bring into a room. I mean, cleaning supplies, a laptop, all kinds of, of uh, configurations. And we ran a bunch of tests to try to come up with heat release rates that were realistic for our models. And it seems to me that uh, this, at, at the very least, having these heat release rate profiles, as we have them summarized in this report and, and another report that is referenced here, that is actually the, the test results, uh, you would find it very useful if you need, for example, I don't know, the, the, the heat release rate of, of, of some boxes, uh, uh, clothing material, I mean, uh, all uh, toolboxes, a lot of that was uh, tested uh, and replicated, and it, we have found it to be very useful. Uh, as, a, as an interesting note, uh, the worst fire that we burned was a rubber made plastic cart that people would use to carry into electrical rooms to do some tests. Uh, that thing had a, a very large peak heat release rate and a long duration once all the plastic was melted. Uh, and it was curious enough because in our uh, database of fire events in the nuclear industry, we did have one of those fires on those cards that actually activated a fire suppression system. So, so it was one that we had to test. We tested it was bad, and it's included in the statistical representation of heat release rates that we have in this report. So uh, I think it's very useful uh, flammability information for all these packages. Uh, and you may want to uh, basically speed read it and see what information is there because you may you may find it necessary for for modeling purposes or for making decisions on what to allow in a specific room. Uh, another one that has been now out for a number of years, which I think uh, has been really uh, very good for fire modelers is this verification and validation study in, uh, in NUREC 1824. And uh, these days, every time I see a fire modeling calculation, it comes a company with a, a verification and validation. So uh, over the last, uh, I don't know, probably 15 years, we have collected a large number of fire experiments uh, and have compared it with uh, fire model results. Uh, so now CFS and FDS have, uh, and some of the hand calculations, have uh, validation studies that suggest a model bias, how, how much it over or under predicts, uh, some variability to the results, and, and, and a range of applications of the model. So, so now when we do a fire modeling calculation, you, you can with confidence say, okay, this model is good for this range of, of geometries, and this is how good the answer can be, and then characterize uh, your results as over predicting, not accurate, et cetera. So that, uh, that was something that was not available 20 years ago, and now it's available, and to the extent that every time NIS releases like a new version of FDS, it comes with a new uh, ver verification and validation package. So if, if you have to do a fire modeling calculation or supervise one or pay for one, uh, this is a way of uh, confirming or, or having some confidence that the calculations are good. Uh, and the last one uh, is this uh, new reg 2178, there are two volumes of it. In one, there is an extensive set of uh, electrical cabinet tests, okay? Uh, and we have heat release rate curves for them. So you, if you're dealing with electrical fires in electrical boxes, this can be a source of very good information uh, to characterize uh, those fires. Uh, in addition, these two volumes have a lot of research associated with FDS and how to model in detail specific scenarios. So, 
So you may find uh, applications of FDS that are documented here uh, uh, useful uh, for gaining insights or to solve problems, right? You can see how we have used FDS to solve some of the modeling problems and, and you may you may have specific problems that some of the ideas that are here are pre-state-of-the-art, pre right? It will be helpful. Uh, of less help, but I, I'll quickly mention it before moving to the next slide, is this NUREX CR7010, which basically has a lot of, of uh, cable properties uh, that help us model cable heat release rates. I, I say of less help because I don't know that you know, outside the nuclear industry, one would model uh, cable fires. But if you do, there is very good information here to do it. So again, these three are the most useful results because what is in here can be used in any industry and it's actually pretty valuable in terms of uh, VNV or flammability information for our studies. All right. Um, let me stop also here on this slide and talk about what's going on at the SFPE. I know Rob uh, mentions this, but we are working on a SFPE engineering guide on fire risk assessment. It would be the second edition. And this second edition is a major update uh, to what was published before. Uh, we have tried to make it uh, useful and put, put material on the line of fire, meaning provide uh, us fire protection engineers with a reference that we can use to argue to AHJs about compliance. So uh, we're doing our best to include in there uh, like uh, risk levels and frequency levels, uh, or numerical numbers that you could use to say, look, this is remote, this should be acceptable, for example, compare the numbers there with what is acceptable in the nuclear industry and say, all right, a risk of this level should be acceptable. I should be able to do this. So we're trying to make it useful in that sense. Uh, as you may have seen already in my presentation, risk, when we model it, it has a, a, some inherent uh, technical complexities. But at least we're trying to put together tools that allows you to have a reference to say, look, I mean, these numbers are listed here. We could we could do it because, right? We're trying to make it useful in that sense. We're also trying to cover both qualitative and quantitative uh, applications, all consistent with NFPA 551. So. Hopefully, um, it's not just another academic reference uh, on on another flowchart to do risk. We know those exist everywhere, and our challenge from day one has been, let's not do that again. Uh, so hopefully, with our examples and a little bit of the positions we're taking there, uh, it's going to be a, a more uh, useful tool, but it's not I mean, it's taking time, it's not easy, and there is a lot of debate. We got a bunch of comments in the ballot process, and now we have to uh, resolve. Uh, if we're lucky, we'll see it out this year. Uh, 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 but we started this year with probably 25 pages of comments that have to be uh, resolved and then go to vote again. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll do our best. That's that's where that effort uh, stands. Uh, we're also working on a new revision of the SFPE handbook, and we are going to reorganize the risk section. It's going to have uh, two sections, one on fundamentals and theory, and the other on applications. So so maybe maybe it's going to look a little bit like this presentation, where I had three, four slides on theory, uh, and then at the end, uh, different applications of fire risk. Uh, we're going to do that, and we're also going to try to reduce uh, duplication and make sure, for example, if we define uncertainty, it's defined only once and not differently in every chapter in the risk section, uh, because some of those problems exist now. Uh, so hopefully, 
uh, uh, we are now in the middle of updating all the chapters. We have identified authors. We were supposed to have those chapters updated by the end of 2020. And I can tell you that none of us finish our chapters. And uh, so that's a, hopefully give it a push on 2021 and see if we can uh, be the first, the risk section to be the first one of going to the editor and see and say, hey, this is our material. All right, so that's the latest uh, that I know on on SFP activities associated with risk and their publications. All right, so um, let's move on to the last part of of the presentation where I have a, a few a few slides here. The first one I'm not going to talk much. It's a fire PRA for nuclear plants. This material could be we can be here for weeks. So I'll just mention that uh, you may all know that we are operating is half of the industry is operating on under a performance based standard that they use risk informed tools to resolve. They use risk informed tools to resolve a bunch of non compliances. And although the plans that went through that process were able to resolve a number of their non-compliances. I, I think the consensus is that this was very, very, very expensive. And uh, um, maybe not all of them are completely convinced that it was uh, worth it. Uh, but uh, it, it does make the point, let me, sorry for, let me stop this in on one second. It does make the point that uh, that I like to make between facilities that are built and when we use risk to inform a design of a new facility, right? Uh, the point of this slide is is twofold. First, to make the point that uh, uh, these facilities are old and they inherit and over the the course of their operation regulations changed and they were not designed to meet those new regulations and really updating them with physical mods uh, would have been uh, not feasible. It would just better to not operate them anymore. And, and therefore some of them decided to go the risk route and they solved their non-compliances. They're now operating under licenses that where those non-compliances have been resolved. Uh, and the debate is, uh, was this uh, work, right? Was this uh, all this effort, which was very expensive, worth? Uh, we did find another good insight is that when they still had to do physical modifications, many of those modifications was not were not to correct a non-compliance, was a modification to reduce risk, which in theory right makes the plant safer. Uh, so, so instead of let's fix this to correct the non-compliance, the non-compliance is still there, but they made a change that reduced the risk of the plant and then were able to say, okay, with these non-compliances, our risk is low enough to be able to operate. So two insights. First, uh, the fact that uh, they were able to resolve non-compliances because they were up, uh, built uh, under design guidelines that didn't meet the new regulations, but also that the modifications that the risk analysis suggested were not just to correct the non-compliances. Those, those would not have done much reducing risk. Uh, the modifications were those that would have, that did reduce risk. Uh, and from that perspective, one could say, right, cost aside, that that the plants you know, you know, are, are safer. The other point in this slide is to point out the risk equation. Uh, sorry, uh, that you can see here a frequency and a consequence term. And we use a bunch of conditional probabilities to represent uh, the mitigation strategies or the scenario configuration. And, and I, the only reason I put the question here is, is to show 
that for a given application for this equation and the model to be powerful, we have to represent suppression, the consequence, the frequency, so that we can detect where the the where we can improve safety, right? If the modification is intended to reduce the consequence term, or is a modification intended to improve the suppression, right? That's how we we know where the insights are coming. And uh, be, and in the nuclear industry, through this very, very, very long and expensive process, we have seen this, this uh, equation uh, work. Uh, and again, as I said, the debate is, is was this, this worth it? Uh, I think the jury is still out. Can, can, can that model be used for other than uh, nuclear power plants? Could it yes. be used? Or a lab or whatever. Yeah, and I'll cover that in a second. I'll, I'll turn out to a new application here. Uh, this is an aircraft hangar, and, and I cannot, right, I, I should not go into a lot of details on what's in here, but it's a very fancy uh, airplane. Uh, and, and the issue here was uh, well, the authority having jurisdiction it's wanting us to uh, have the uh, ceiling, ceiling foam system, right? And, and it's not working. We have not had it operational. We can't fix it. It's too expensive. Uh, so so can, what is the risk of this? Do we really need it? Uh, so we, we, we build a risk assessment uh, that looks at that. And, and this is an example of what I was talking about. When we build a model, and I'll go over this model quickly in a minute, we solve it assuming that their system was operating and not operating, and then debated you know, if that made any difference given all the other stuff that they had. So in this, in this hangar, they had the, this overhead system, but they also had the, the floor-mounted monitors, right, to spray foam in the underwing, and and I'm, I'm not right an expert on the issues associated with this foam system, but through this project I did hear that this is a system that you don't want releasing in your hangar accidentally because it, 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 environmentally it's a problem, it's very expensive to clean up. So, so and, and again, I mean, if you guys may know more about this that I, I, I really don't know all the details, but those are some of the issues I heard. And they were trying to say, well, we have had issues with this before. It has not been operational for some time. Do we really uh, want to have this in? And after a bunch of research on these uh, reading events on, on hangar fires, uh, studying what they had, it, there is an argument to be made to the AHJ that maybe this uh, ceiling foam system is really not reducing the risk as much as you have. And the reason that we have been debating is that uh, a lot has to do with uh, having a spill. Uh, and in all these hangars, that's prohibited. I mean, you cannot have refueling operations inside so that's controlled by procedure uh, and uh, so so when you look at the the spill probabilities inside and quite frankly if you have a big spill and it ignites uh, you probably have a big fire and will have some damage anyways even if you release this this foam we basically said you have, you know, with your, your underwing systems and your procedure controls and just looking at this probability of having a big spill, an argument to be made to the AHJ that you could probably operate. I don't know how successful they, they had been and, and this is ongoing. So, so I, I mean, I cannot give you, I cannot tell you this was completely successful but I can tell you that the strategy was 
study what needs to happen for us to have a big spill inside a hangar and then uh, and then uh, see how you would put the chronology here in our model on how things would be resolved, right? So you have your prompt detection and suppression. You have the manual activation of these uh, underwing systems, okay? Uh, and then you have a fire department response that we thought would be late if you really have a big spill inside that is ignited. Uh, and then you have a system of trenches that would localize the spill to different places. And this is just specific to the configuration of this hangar. And depending if, if these things fail, you would have right a, a lot of uh, a lot of damage or not. And when you crank all these numbers, you see that with or without that ceiling system, if you have a big spill, you have a big problem anyways, right? Uh, and, and, and when you compare that, those two cases, we thought, well, the code requires the, these ceiling mounted sprinklers for, for the foam system. Uh, so that would be the compliant case. You, you, you meet the code. Let's see what the risk says if you don't have it or you have it compromised. And then you debate what are the factors affecting it uh, and try to argue that to the AHJ. So that, that's, that's a study that we work. And you can see that we have the same structure that I, I cover at the beginning, right? It's ignition. Then you have in here a spill, a spill uh, probability. And there are studies on airport spills and fires all of them outside because you cannot do this inside. And there are also events of accidents inside hangars. And when you read them, you say, oh boy, I mean, it, it's basically a, a forklift punctures a tank. I mean, there are all kinds of things that you read and you, you say, boy, this is really unlikely. But at the same time, as fire protection engineers, we know that all these fires is because something crazy happened. So, um, when you put all those numbers, you, you can then develop a set of conclusions that are backed with these results and, and argue with the AHJ. And uh, quite frankly, among us here, I think in this specific client, at the very least, they, they gain some time. They have a study that they can argue with the AHJ and get some, some uh, agreements to you know, fix less or fix it later type of thing. Um, another, and this is really new stuff, are these uh, battery energy storage uh, systems. Uh, and, and I have here a story about uh, one of these systems that had an event that is called thermal runaway. This is not the picture of this event, okay? This is another picture that I, had from from our collection, uh, uh, so uh, uh, you 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 may know, but these are basically containers, like like a shipping container, uh, with a bunch of batteries interconnected that that you use as to store energy. I mean, it it could be like a diesel generator. It, it, eventually, we may see them in our nuclear plants, right? So uh, replacing a diesel generator. Uh, but they have this specific failure mode that is thermal runaway. It's basically an explosion. Uh, I am, and I admit, I'm not an expert on the failure mechanisms that produces this, uh, but it's a recognized event that is very bad, right? You don't want this happening uh, in a container that you have in a parking lot uh, near a building. Uh, and uh, so, and our understanding, and again, uh, it, I am not the expert on, on these mechanisms, that in facilities that are equipped with a clean agent system, the, the chemical, the gases that are produced by the batteries, if this event happened, mixed with the clean agent, can produce even more harmful gases that is, uh, if you're near a community, could create an environmental problem, right? So, 
So this is new, this is new technology, and you may even hear uh, politicians in recent days, I've, I've heard them, when they talk about economic growth, they, they mention battery technology. Well, this is part of it. Uh, and um, we, we have seen clients with new products that have to go through UL testing and have to develop a, a fire protection for these containers, uh, which, include, which include venting, uh, deflagration venting, it includes uh, water suppression, it includes all those things, right? Uh, um, gas detection, uh, to see if we catch this thermal runaway uh, before it happens and control or control it, right? So, so we have developed uh, as part of, of, of work associated with this where it, of course, us as consultants provide design services uh, for, for, for whatever is needed in these containers, but they're also part of the work includes hazard analysis, risk assessment, and a, a pre-fire plans, right, to, uh, for our clients, for, for the risk assessment uh, groups to uh, maintain a, a, an understanding of the risk and the mitigation strategies that are put into these containers. And, and the event tree, this is an example of one that looks like, okay, I start with a thermal runaway, I may or may not have a clean agent system, and every company has a position if this is a recommended strategy. I already mentioned a serious a serious issue with it, so it's a good reason. That I've seen some people not recommending it, because you're not going to protect for much, and if you have a thermal runaway, it's not going to help, and then it's going to make things worse. So anyways, I, again, I'm not... The, the right guy to talk what are the best things here because at the time we get on this, many of these things are built and they have it on or the question is asked, do we put it in or not? Anyways, in a, in a risk model, you could turn it on and off. So we, we have it here. Uh, there are sprinklers and, and these sprinklers, I've seen them automatic or it's just a, a dry pipe for a fire brigade to come and hook water to it. Uh, there is venting, and this venting come in different shapes, right? And then there is a fire department response, and then at the end we say, well, is there a local population nearby, or this is in the middle of the desert? Uh, and uh, with that, we classify, right, consequences to be minor, meaning this is just limited to the battery damage. You just have to replace the battery. Or you blow up the entire facility, and that is critical, and maybe kill firefighters. I think in this uh, Arizona event, there were fatalities. Uh, or you have fatalities, and all of a sudden, you have gases in your nearby community, and people are affected, which then becomes really a, a critical, catastrophic uh, event. So, so it's all relative, but we have basically build a model that again you see is a, a frequency a consequence and in between we have all the mitigation strategies and, and 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 these serve us to meet the code requirements of a hazard analysis right this is way more than a hazard analysis because it's even telling designers and risk people because you have sprinklers you have minimized all your catastrophic events to only these two conditions, and they are depending on, let's say, venting. That stresses how important vent is, and then you develop your procedures to ensure that those systems are, are working, right? So this is another very recent application of risk that we have been uh, working on because this is new technology, and we, we have been uh, seeing uh, you know, quite a bit of demand for, for this. Um, I'll be a little bit more general on this because these are Navy applications, but did you may imagine that we have, like for example, submarines where we cannot put all the detection and suppression that we would want, and we rely on, on the response of people, uh, and these, these facilities are in different modes of operation, right, at dock, at the sea, et cetera. 
and 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 what kind of training, uh, uh, what kind of of procedures we need to improve our ability to detect and suppress fires. Uh, uh, it's something that by building another similar tree, like the ones I've been discussing, uh, have been helpful to make decisions on, on, for example, if we are a dog, do we need to install a fixed system while we are uh, doing work at dog? Okay, so, so that's the type of, of uh, analysis uh, that, we, that we focus with a little bit in depth and more critical stuff that you know you understand we we can cover but the bottom line is that we can model the fire protection response and so so you can see um, all these applications that ends up being the same type of structure that i cover at the beginning that's why i i i put it in the introduction because it all has to do with let's understand what are our mitigations in what order they come and then build all three. Uh, th then, then the question that, that usually comes is, well, what probabilities you use? And my answer to that is um, they, they are available uh, through the work that has been done in the nuclear industry, through um, research, you end up finding the probabilities you need. And sometimes once you start putting those numbers in a tree, you start noticing which of them are more important than others. And then you, you kind of do more research on those. Uh, and that's what I found that, that it, it should not be a stop of uh, a problem for applying it because you can develop it. For example, let me give you a quick example. In, when we started working with these hangar fires, um, we said, of course, let's understand fire events, and what has happened, how people have mitigated them to make sure our tree is right. And our initial look was not uh, research papers or, or, or technical reports. I simply went to Google and, and put hangar fires. And all I found was a long list of news reports, uh, evening news that we're still hanging out in Google of people reporting of hangar fires. And those gave very good information and insights uh, on, on how they start and gave us a good notion on, okay, this, this is how we should uh, uh, build, build this. And then, and then you slowly start gathering more and more uh, right, reliable technical information that news reports, but, from from a, a situational awareness of, of how these things happen, those were great insights. Now, uh, some some concluding remarks that that I have here. Um, first, let's um, some concluding remarks on what I have here. Uh, first, a distinction between. Uh, hazard analysis and risk analysis. Let me send a text to my kids to shut up as they're yelling. Okay, so uh, uh, I had that on my, on my first uh, slides, right? The difference between hazard and risk. Uh, I, we see that and I, I, I can tell you that has cost me business-wise some some work because you 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 get asked to do a risk assessment and and you offer something that is not what they want right so so the insight is we all people confuse these terms and we need to talk to them to make sure we we know what they want um so so hazard is just a list of hazards things that can cause harm but when we talk about risk we have to to characterize those hazards in terms of frequency and consequence. And we use scenarios to, to build those, right? To, to characterize those hazards and what can happen. Uh, and it's, so, so that's a distinction that, that I like making. Uh, remember that there is significant research 
in the nuclear industry over the last 20 years in support of these uh, efforts that I described. And a lot of that is very useful outside the nuclear industry. There are probabilities to, for characterizing systems with references for them. There is a flammability information that has been collected. Uh, and I pointed out some of the most useful for outside of the nuclear industry. Um, we talk about risk assessment for, for helping the design uh, and the inventories that we have built for these uh, energy storage facilities uh, inform the, the design process uh, versus the built facilities where you may use risk to resolve non-compliances where it's really very expensive to solve them. And I gave you the, the example of the hangar. I gave you the example of, of, of commercial nuclear plants where, where really if we have to fix this, it's better uh, not to operate the facility anymore. And, and, and may, maybe a risk assessment gets you through uh, operating the facility for, for some additional period of time. Uh, the importance of the accident sequence goes back to my main message on understanding the structure of these trees that are typically used. Uh, that's what an accident sequence is, where you put the, the, the chronology at the top. And, and if you consolidate your project, your application in, into trying to develop a tree with an accident sequence, you can get to insights and conclusions that can help you uh, support uh, your case. Uh, and finally, uh, pay attention to what SFP is doing on risk. As I said, we're writing a guide and we are updating the SFP handbook. Uh, and my opinion and what I have asked our groups to do is to uh, make a point, right? Make it useful give our fire protection engineers a tool that they can argue with the NAHJ, with numbers, with arguments, uh, so that we can promote uh, the use of this, uh, this technology to solve problems, solve compliant problems and improve designs. Um, so so that's, those are my prepared slides. Uh, uh, I thank you all of you again for inviting me. Uh, I had fun presenting and preparing this, so, so uh, I'm also happy to to have a debate here and, and go through questions. So, Francis, the question I had earlier was on the design versus built facilities. Um, on the frequency and probability, what would you use as a basis for that? Or where would you get that data outside of the nuclear in industry? Yeah, so um, the actually the probabilities that we use in the nuclear industry to characterize detection suppression systems are, are actually generic. Those numbers, if you read the documents we have are are pretty generic. Uh, in the nuclear plants, they they maintain uh, they maintain records of the inspections, and some some of them update those generic numbers uh, with uh, with uh, plant specific information. But the generics work, and what we have actually found is that. Okay, we can argue if your sprinklers are less or more reliable uh, than others, but uh, if, if you have them or not, will, you will see a difference, right? So, so that, that's the other point that maybe I didn't make very clearly. And I get stiff to, your, to the frequency point in a minute, but in terms of characterizing the, the mitigation strategies, uh, the numbers that we use are generic, but more than that, uh, if, you, if you use generic numbers for a specific application, I think what you will see is that 
even if those numbers are off by a little bit, your conclusions will not change. Uh, and a point that I didn't make here that it's probably pretty important is that is to uh, do a little bit of sensitivity analysis with 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 your model, right? With those event trees, uh, where will you say, okay, what if I am wrong with this reliability? Will that change my conclusion? And the answer, in many cases, is no, which it's further evidence to an AHJ uh, of of the robustness of the analysis. For example, in this um, in this uh, aircraft hangar example, okay. Let's say you don't know very well your ignition frequency, and you don't know very well the reliability of your uh, monitors. Okay. Okay. So. If you have a spill, the probability of this spill was the governing factor. Even if you move this ignition frequency an order of magnitude up or down, if you have a spill, that is a problem. Okay, same with your, your suppression system. So, so in here, the, the insight is really you have to have very strict procedures to control the potential for spills. So you cannot do, I mean, whatsoever, any refuel operation inside uh, these hangars. And, 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 and in, in my involvement with, with other airport uh, projects, you see that such requirements uh, are implemented and, and really create problems uh, because you have to, you know, move, move the aircraft outside to. to so, so, uh, so, 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 my first point on on answering your question, Steve, is that um, sometimes we focus on on a specific number, and maybe if we study and and look at what generic numbers are available that have references and and are used often. Those are probably good enough because the insights that you're going to gain are going to tell you, OK, um, even small variations in this is not going to change uh, my conclusions. In terms of ignition uh, frequencies, uh, yes, in the nuclear industry, there is 40 years of data, 40 calendar years. It's more than 5,000 uh, reactor years. Of, of power plant operation in which we have collected <coughs> fire events data for all types of ignition sources in the plant and have come up with ignition frequencies. And in such a control environment, you know, X number of plants uh, designed by two, with two overall main designs, etc., cetera, uh, and, and and a steady source of, of data, we, we, we have a good database to produce those numbers and makes our lives a little bit easier because we have the starting point. Uh, if that is not available, we usually go through a little bit of research and, and I understand it's, it's research, but we make it practical, right? It's not it's not something that it's going to take us to the pedigree of, you know, the, the, what we do in the nuclear industry uh, and formulate uh, a value that it's hopefully within an order of magnitude, within the order of magnitude of where it needs uh, to be. Uh, and I gave you the example of the hangar fires. Uh, those are uh, the big fires are known. Uh, so you go through the assessment of, okay, we have seen these events. Uh, these hangars have been operating for quite some time and we have many of them. And that usually points you to a starting point that you can then see if it is really the governing factor or not. Um, in, in facilities like these battery ones, uh, such events, uh, are becoming known, so we are working on developing those frequencies. So um, I don't have a great answer. It's a challenge uh, for, for 
for specific applications, you can overcome it with a little bit of research, uh, but the main answer is uh, sensitivity and uncertainty at the end to see if that is really uh, driving your conclusion. And if it's driving your conclusion and you have a lot of uncertainty in it, then, then that's one of the limitations. So um, in summary, uh, I think that we have two main challenges to promote the use of risk. One is uh, the lack of acceptance criteria in many industries. And, and I hope that with the new engineering guide where we're going to provide examples of a risk matrix, uh, that is uh, a little bit, that addresses that, that uh, problem. The second is some of the data characterization. And I think that the ignition frequency, one of the, the most problematic ones outside of the nuclear industry, the, the, the system reliability, it's a little bit better because we have generic numbers. And that one, uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, harder to, to tackle. We have tackled it uh, by, by doing research, right? Researching events, and then trying to predict and um, trying to assess what has been the exposure time and come up with the value that then we debate if it's uncertain and sensitive in making our conclusions. I, I, I think, Steve, sorry for the long answer, but it, it's a complicated uh, issue. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other, any other questions? Yeah, yes, Francis? Yeah. Um, I, I, I was wondering those uh, those new reg documents that you had cited earlier uh, for like probabl probabilistic things for like cable cable tray fires and um, yeah. short electrical short circuits and such um, are, are those public domain? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you in fact in preparing this presentation, I put in Google new reg seventy one fifty and. It shows up, and I did a screen capture and shrink it. So they are all public. Uh, that's why um, I, I put the number here. And um, in the two specifics that you mentioned, uh, this one, it's basically a collection of cable fire tests that were done at NIST, that they burn cables in trays and, and characterize how they burn. and and recommended a model to predict a heat release rate. But it has good information like, you know, kilowatts per square meter of cable burning, et cetera. So um, uh, we, we use it all the time for our, our nuclear work. Uh, this one, another one, I am not an expert using it, but there are specific right, probabilities listed here for, for if you burn a cable, what's the probability that you know two conductors short between them and produce a signal? So um, the, the, the electrical configuration and when to use it, it's a little bit of an area that, that, that I cannot cover, uh, but we use it all the time to characterize the potential of, of system maloperation because you shorted a cable. And it's based uh, this one specifically, just imagine that, that you have a circuit built and you have a computer system collecting basically conduction information in those cables in that circuit operating. And then you put a fire in the cable and then you see the computer is going to pick up right what happened to the, the, con to the current going through the conductors. Uh, and, and with that, and a lot of discussion <laughs> with a bunch of people in the conference room, there is a probabilities for these shorts in specific configurations. Uh, and interesting, and we, we, we found interesting configurations. For example, we saw configurations in, into which you burn a cable and the current goes through the cable tray and goes into another cable. <laughs> so so we, we saw all kinds of stuff that is summarized in diagrams, et cetera there. So, so yes, this is um, all public. Uh, and uh, and and you know available for, for use to 
this is another one on human reliability. How, how and, and a lot of this is focused on how operators would go and do stuff under a, a fire event, okay, or how operators will will shut down a plant if you have a fire in the control room. It's, so and and how to put that in a in a risk assessment. So it's a little bit advanced because it's a lot of human reliability analysis, uh, and and and. And, and you need procedures and all of that, uh, but it's been research that been done recently, and and it's really, really, uh, uh, very, very, very detailed. So, so yeah, that's so it's all public. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesco. Are, are you willing to share this presentation so I can send it out to the chapter? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, that's why I, I was a little bit careful in some of these slides not to put, you know, any kind of detail. So so it's all, all, it's all, some of this is, yes, the trackers. I see, I see that it was copyrighted as well, so. Um. Oh, oh the, yeah, that's, that's our Jensen News template, but I don't know that. None of this information is really, uh, I mean, I, I never re unveil any secret or anything. I may, uh, Rob, what I will do is I'll take this picture out because I don't have like permission to use it. Uh, and, and I'll check on this copyright statement and I'll send it to Steve to you or to you, Rob. You, you can send it to, to Steve or myself or both. And also check, we, we do, we try to record and, and make these available. So if it's, if that's an option, then please let us know and we'll, we'll make this available um, as a recorded session for those that attended and, and others that I don't attended. think I have here any client information at all or anything. I think it's perfectly fine. All of this is a very generic material. So when will you be coming back to teach us the second class? Yeah. <laughs> Season. Right. Um, any other question? All right, Rob and Steve, thanks for the invitation and all of you for attending and listening. Uh, I had fun and uh, keep in touch. If, you, if I can be of any help, you have any questions, let me know. Certainly will, Francisco. Thank you. And thank um, you, Francisco. Appreciate it. Was a thank wonderful you. presentation. It was it was really technical, and that that's something that we don't always always get. So this was really really great. Um, pretty high caliber presentation. So thank you very much for that. Sure, no problem. And for those of you in the chapter that, that don't know, um, Jason Butler and I do do sit on that on the fire risk task team. So we're, we're engaged in that effort, and a few others at SFPE. We have several members that are engaged at various efforts in at the SFP uh, level. So, um, if any of you guys want to get engaged, just speak up and we'll get you connected if you aren't already. So, without any other questions or anything to do, then I, I guess we'll probably end this meeting. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Have a great day, guys. Thanks, Rob. Cheers. Thanks, Rob.